Good morning. Thank you all for joining this session. This session is titled Developing a Wearable Therapeutic Device for Suppressing the Urge to Tick in Tourette Syndrome, Recent Progress and Future Plans. Presented as part of the TAA 2022 National Conference. My name is Dr. Seanich Anderson, and I'm a research consultant for the Tourette's Association of America. This session is being offered for both live and virtual attendees. During the session, we would be very happy to hear from you and include your voice in the conversation. For our virtual attendees, you may ask questions or share comments in the chat. For our in-person attendees, we ask that everyone put their phones on vibrate so as not to interrupt the presenter. And we will address questions from all attendees at the end of the presentation, depending on time. We ask that you please be sure to fill out the session survey at the end of the session, and you can do so via the conference app. With that, I will turn the session over to our speaker, Dr. Stephen Jackson from the University of Nottingham. Okay, th thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, I was asked to talk to you a bit about uh, a couple of things that you heard in the earlier session. So one of them is non-invasive brain stimulation using um, something called transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is a device I'll explain a bit about. And then the second thing is, uh, as in the title there, I'm going to talk to you about our attempts to develop a wearable therapeutic device um, that's based on median nerve stimulation, which you heard in, in uh, a bit about in one of the earlier talks, and show you some data from that. And then I've left an awful lot of time for questions, because I've found when I've given this talk before um, that people have lots of questions. So there'll be plenty of time for questions, and uh, yeah, so I'll make a start. So just a couple of things, so, so we're all oriented, um, Tourette's, uh, our tick disorder is a neurological condition of childhood onset. Uh, it's characterized by unwanted movements and vocalizations known as tics. The key things uh, that I want you to think about uh, or be aware of is that um, we think that the occurrence of tics, and I'll show you a bit of data on this, is due to altered function in the brain networks uh, controlling movements. We've heard about that earlier. Um, and one of the key ideas which I want us to think about is that it's linked to hyperexcitability in those cortical areas that give rise to movements. Um, ticks can be suppressed. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the idea that you can compress, uh, suppress your ticks, but this uh, gives rise to uncomfortable um, sensations, feelings, which are, and that uh, suppression is difficult to sustain. And uh, we tend to term those uncomfortable sensations as premonitory urges. And my experience of premonitory urges, talking to people about them, is they will often express this as a sort of bodily sensation, a sense of pressure, uh, of uncomfortable bodily sensations that builds up. And then when they tick, they feel get some relief. I don't know if that's most people's experience. But this is important uh, in the context of uh, what we're trying to achieve with our, our potential therapy. Um, I, I, just a bit of background. I wasn't sure how much people knew about this, so I'm just going to give you a bit of background of the motivation for where we're coming from in thinking about this therapy. So, how does our brain control of our, our actions? Well, communication in the brain is achieved by means of brain cells, which we call neurons, which send messages to each other and to the body. And those messages are based on two types of information transmission. One is electrical, so electrical signals are sent down the axons of these neurons. And then at the end of those axons, we have the transmission of chemical messages, um, and we've heard a bit about that earlier. So the important thing is, that we have electrical signals that are involved in the release of these chemical signals. And as you heard this morning, most of the drugs that are used are modulating these sorts of chemical signals. Okay, so how does the um, brain control our actions? Well, we can think of these neurons as sending messages, lots of them simultaneously. And we could think about this 
as the idea then that many different neurons may be sending messages all at the same time. Think of them as sort of shouting out what they've got to say. And if we allowed all of those signals to have equal weight, we'd have a problem of trying to understand them. So somehow the brain has got to work out how to select the messages that are important and control the others. And to do that, we know that the key neuron sending messages, shown here, this is a pyramidal neuron, can be modulated by these interneurons. Um, and these will have essentially have an effect on the efficacy of this neuron in sending its message. So these are the way that we control, or the brain controls its signals. And you've heard about some of the neurotransmitter modulators this morning. You've heard about dopamine. You've heard about GABA. And in my mind, GABA is particularly important. So this is what we think is going on in a key part of the um, brain that we heard about this morning, the basal ganglia. A particular a part of the basal ganglia which is known as the striatum. And in the striatum, we have here this pyramidal, or this cell, which is sending messages elsewhere in the brain, and it is modulated by these GABAergic interneurons. And you can see that there may be several of these acting to control the output of this neuron. So this is what we think is happening in a neurotypical brain. One of the things we think is happening in Tourette syndrome is that some of these GABAergic interneurons at the level of the striatum are not working effectively, or there may be fewer of them. And as a consequence, their ability to control these projection neurons is altered. And so for what we can think of is that in a neurotypical brain, there's roughly a balance between excitation and inhibition, and that that balance is perturbed in Tourette syndrome producing this hyperexcitability. So that's a sort of cartoon overview of what we think is going on um, to cause this sort of imbalance in this functioning of this motor system, motor network, sorry. So uh, a cartoon that illustrates this, uh, this is the sort of brain areas that we've talked about earlier. This is the cortex up here, the motor areas of cortex. These are the basal ganglia nuclei you've heard about earlier. This is the thalamus. Remember in the last talk we heard about deep brain stimulation, targeting neurons here, uh, or targeting um, areas here in the thalamus. Okay, this is the circuit then we think is, is, is not working as it should. And a, um, a small cartoon here illustrates what we think is going on generally, that you get striatal disinhibition, so an overactivity at this level, which leads to a release of the thalamus um, from inhibition, uh, which leads to hyperactivity here, which is linked to the generation of ticks. And we can get some idea about this through using brain imaging to understand what's going on, for example, in the brain before a tick. So this is an MRI scanner, and when we use an MRI scanner, we can look at areas of activity that are associated with particular actions. So, as an example, this simply shows brain areas of activity that when people are swallowing, they're making swallowing movements. Importantly, when people have studied what happens in the brain immediately before we tick, we see something quite interesting. So, this is a study published in 2014, and what it shows is the following. It shows up here areas that are active two seconds before you tick. In blue here, we see areas that are active one second before you tick. And then in green here, we see brain areas that are active when you tick. And that what I want to draw your attention to is that there are differences in where these activities lie. So, for example, one second before you tick, we're seeing activity, for example, in the medial parts, of, so the center parts of the cortex, uh, so the supplementary motor area, the mid-cingulate cortex, and an area that's particularly important for premonitory urges, we think, the insular cortex. But interestingly, and this is the important point from my perspective, 
When you actually tick, we see activity in brain areas associated with movement generation. So the cerebellum uh, and the motor cortex itself. And the reason I, I want to highlight that is because these non-invasive brain stimulation techniques I'm going to tell you about are aimed at modulating those areas that are involved in the generation of movements or the sensory aspects of movement. So perhaps the cerebellum, uh, perhaps the uh, motor cortex or the primary somatosensory cortex. Okay. Those are the areas that actually are active when you actually tick. Okay, just a bit about uh, current treatment. You've heard a bit about this this morning. Um, as you heard, the first-line treatment for Tourette's that's advocated by uh, clinicians is typically some form of behavioural therapy because of its uh, performance and its uh, adverse effect profile. Uh, we've heard about different sorts of medication that are available, and we've heard about deep brain stimulation. What's interesting is uh, with deep brain stimulation, as we've heard, it's actually extremely effective. Um, so you see here, um, as we heard earlier, improvements in tick uh, scores of around about 50%. Uh, this is from a meta-analysis recently, which compared uh, the eff efficacy of medication and behavioural treatments. And as you see, the deep brain stimulation produces about 50% improvement, whereas both medication and behavioural treatments produce something like about 22% or 20% improvement. And importantly, the effects of deep brain stimulation are often on people with the most severe tics. So if you look at the average tick score of people with medication or behavioural treatments, it's around about 50 out of 100, whereas for deep brain stimulation, the people entered into these deep brain stimulation studies tended to have much more severe tics, as measured by Yale. So it does look like deep brain stimulation is um, efficacious that, uh, and that it's effective in reducing people's tics. Unfortunately, in the UK... It's uh, an experimental medicine treatment, so it's not available on the national health, uh, so few people can get access to it. So that brings up then the question, are there other forms of brain stimulation that are non-invasive, that don't have uh, many of the issues of, uh, for example, deep brain stimulation, that could be equally effective in treating Tourette syndrome? And one that we heard mentioned this morning was the idea of transcranial magnetic stimulation, uh, in fact, repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, and that's illustrated here. So the way this works, I don't know if people are familiar with this idea, but the way this works is as follows. Um, a coil is held over the, cortex, uh, over the scalp here, and a brief electrical current is passed through the coil, and this produces a fluctuating magnetic field. And that fluctuating magnetic field is sufficient to induce secondary currents uh, within the cortex underneath the coil. This stimulation could be delivered very briefly in brief pulses. And it can be used, for example, over the motor areas to induce action potential. So it can induce neuronal firing. And open-label studies have indicated some success in using this type of technique for um, the treatment of people with Tourette syndrome. So there is some evidence to suggest that this may be an alternative, and of course it has a, a much better uh, adverse effect profile, for example, than deep brain stimulation. I think it's worth illustrating or emphasising, though, what people might be doing um, with um, non-invasive brain stimulation because it's important in thinking about the results. So uh, non-invasive brain stimulation um, is a very flexible uh, and useful technique that can be used in lots of different ways. The way that it's often been used is to produce what I would call an offline therapeutic benefit. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, the suggestion is that this can be used to modulate brain networks, 
by, for example, increasing or decreasing uh, cortical excitability according to the type of stimulation given. So the idea here of an offline therapeutic benefit might be that you come along, you have several sessions in the clinic of non-invasive brain stimulation, and that produces a benefit that outlasts the stimulation. So it means that you go away and for a month, three months, six months, you see a reduction in your tics as a result of a therapy. Okay? So I'd call that an offline effect. Okay? You have the stimulation, and then you see the benefits afterwards. Another, I think, very powerful way that it can be used is an, as an adjunct to therapy. So one of the things that we know that non-invasive brain stimulation can do is to enhance learning and synaptic plasticity. So that's one of the things that it's less controversial is that we lots of evidence that stimulation improves learning. So the suggestion here as an adjunct to therapy is that um, you can improve learning and therefore if you deliver stimulation at the same time as you're delivering therapy, you can improve the uh, effectiveness of the therapy. So for example, if you gave it at the same time as CBIT or the same time as ERP, you might improve the efficacy of that therapy. The last one I'm going to tell you about is this idea that you can have online modulation of brain network function. And what I'm suggesting here is that you can use brain, non-invasive brain stimulation in the same way that deep brain stimulation works. So if you think about deep brain stimulation, once the electrodes are implanted, they're turned on, and you see the benefits of the stimulation while the stimulation is on. So while you're being stimulated, you see tick reduction and maybe reduction of other co-occurring symptoms. If you turn the stimulation off, sometimes the ticks will return. So it's online stimulation is producing the beneficial effects. And that's important to contrast with this idea that you give stimulation and see a beneficial effect afterwards that outlasts the stimulation. So let's look at um, the efficacy of this offline stimulation using um, transcranial magnetic stimulation. So here is a list of studies that have been carried out to date. Um, you'll see that they're different colour-coded. So up here, we have studies that are largely open-label and have shown beneficial effects. There is one randomised controlled trial here in which the stimulation was blinded. But typically, these are open-label trials, which means the subject was aware of, or the participant was aware of, um, that they were receiving the stimulation. In most cases... The stimulation has been given to an area of the cortex known as the supplementary motor area. You see that it involved multiple sessions. And in general, the type of stimulation I've shown here in blue is low-frequency repetitive TMS, which is thought to have an inhibitory effect. So it's thought to drive down the excitability of the tissue that's being stimulated. In red here, I've shown high-frequency stimulation, which is thought to have the opposite effect. It's thought to increase cortical excitability. And what you can also see from these open-label studies is that in some there's tick reduction. In others, there's also reduction of co-occurring symptoms. Like, for example, in this case, the uh, symptoms of ADHD or the symptoms of OCD in this case uh, or in these cases here. Um, note, as we heard about some of the other studies for deep brain stimulation, the numbers in these studies are often quite small. So, for example, this study is based on an N of 2 individuals. Um, this one is an N of 10. This is better. This is an N of 25. But um, these are still relatively small numbers. So the open-label studies look quite, quite good, uh, at least promising. Unfortunately, when you look at the when you look at the uh, randomised controlled trials, the picture isn't quite as good. So for these randomised controlled trials, 
in which the participant is blind to which condition they're in, and so is typically the, the, the people doing the, the data analysis. There's no change between uh, placebo and um, active stimulation. So these are, are less promising um, of the effectiveness of these um, TMS studies. Why might that be? Hopefully I've got some data on this. Okay, uh, I haven't here got the data on that. Um, it was in my talk yesterday, I, I, I said about what. Um, I, if I'm asking questions, I can go through why I think they don't work. But for the moment, let's just assume that they're not particularly effective. One possibility is, uh, I'll just tell you about this, I think maybe the issue is that trying to achieve offline benefits of stimulation maybe isn't effective and isn't likely to be effective for a number of reasons. It may be the type of stimulation given, it may be some of the underlying assumptions that you're driving up or down cortical excitability, maybe that isn't what's actually happened or, or even required, but the point is they don't look to be particularly effective. Um, just uh, before we get on to the next part of the talk, which is about the type of therapy I'm advocating, um, just a, a few things about treatment in the UK. I'm not sure whether this mirrors your own experience in the US, but in the United Kingdom, um, access to treatment is normally gained via access to the National Health Service. So this is treatment is free at the point of delivery. But in order to get that treatment, you have to basically get some sort of diagnosis. And so provision for tick disorders is actually very limited in the UK, and it varies across the country. So if you happen to be in London, there's probably quite good provision, and you have a good chance of getting some en route to treatment. But in other parts of the country, there's no provision at all. So even if you were to get a diagnosis, uh, there's no treatment. And we can see that here. So in um, the UK, we have a, a national charity, a bit like the TAA, and the uh, charity carried out a survey in 2020 where they asked members of the association um, about their experience. And what they found was um, that about 56 people, 56% 56 of people who were diagnosed with Tourette's or tick disorder waited longer than a year to get their diagnosis. About 29% waited longer than two years, and 19% waited longer than three years to get their diagnosis. I don't know how that e experience uh, mirrors what you've experienced. But the worrying thing for me is that more than half of those people, at the same time they got a diagnosis, were discharged without any further treatment. So they waited all that time for diagnosis and then got discharged with no further access to treatment which is worrying. So why is that relevant? Well, when we ask people for our research priorities, what should we be focusing on, then people with Tourette's and their families will often say something like, what they want us to do is to develop a low-cost, safe and effective non-drug treatment that can be used to give the individual control over their tics. That's what people want. And ideally, they want this control to be used outside of the clinic. So they don't want to travel hundreds of miles, potentially, to a clinic to get treatment. They want something that they can use in their own home, or at school, or in the office, or going through the airport, to give them control over their tics. So that was the starting point for the work that uh, we've been doing lately. And that led us to this idea. Could we use the peripheral nervous system to modulate those cortical brain sensory motor networks that are linked to the generation of ticks. So when I showed you that fMRI study of which parts of the brain are active, could we use the peripheral nervous system to engage with that system and change the way it's working uh, beneficially? And in particular, we chose to ask, could we utilize median nerve stimulation, which I think was referred to in an earlier talk, to entrain those brain oscillations linked to the suppression of movement and thereby reduce the urge to tick in Tourette's syndrome. 
So just a little bit about how we, about brain oscillations themselves. These are the things we're targeting. So I want to tell you a bit about why they're relevant. So this is a machine we use to measure the electrical or the magnetic activity in the brain. So when those neurons fire, that electrical signal creates magnetic fields that can be measured with a device like this. So it looks like a big hairdryer. People sit in it when they do things that involve their brain, then we can measure the activity uh, through that magnetic field. When neurons in different parts of the brain talk to each other, okay, their firing rates tend to be coupled synchronously. And we can measure that as brain waves or brain oscillations. And the important thing about those brain oscillations is they're associated with different sorts of behavior. So in this case, we're looking at here, this is uh, a measurement taken with this sort of machine which shows the following. On this axis on the bottom here is time. On this axis here, we have the frequency of those oscillations, so how fast they're going up and down in synchrony with one another. And then the colors are telling us about the power of those oscillations. And the important thing in this diagram here is that this period of time the person is making a movement. Okay, it might be something simple like moving their finger or moving their arm or whatever. But the important thing is you see that with this frequency of oscillations, when they move, these, the power in those oscillations is reduced. And when you stop moving, they increase. So what this is telling us is that in order to execute movements, we might have to turn off these brain oscillations. So I want you to think of an analogy here to think about what's happening here. Imagine that these brain oscillations, these ones here, the power in these is somehow reflecting a stable movement state. So think about you're in a car. Okay? When you're stationary, you might be sitting there stationary with a handbrake on. In order to move, you have to release the handbrake. Then you might drive somewhere. When you stop, you might put the handbrake back on. That's a sort of analogy for what we think goes on here. That in order to move, we have to turn off these brain oscillations. So our hypothesis for this work that I'm going to describe was, if we could somehow increase the power in these brain oscillations, we might be able to remove these unwanted involuntary movements. That's a sort of simple idea, but that's uh, the basis of what we're wanting to do. How might we do that? Well, one way is to somehow give some external signal which allows us to increase the power of those oscillations. So, again, an analogy. Imagine you're walking along and someone plays some music, which has a heavy bass line. What will tend to happen is your movements will become synchronized to that bass line. So you imagine you're walking along and someone's banging a drum. You might tend to walk to the beat. Does that make sense to people? Right. So we're trying to do the same thing, but we're not now banging a drum with an auditory signal, but we're stimulating at a particular frequency, which is the frequency we want to target. So we're giving electrical stimulation of the nerve at a particular frequency. Okay, I'll skip this. Um, we use this brain imaging technique to see if this is working. So what happens in the brain when we give this rhythmic stimulation a particular frequency? And we compared it against the same number of stimuli but the non-rhythmic, and this is the finding. I'll get to the good stuff about how it affects Tourette's people in a second, but let me just explain that now here, this is when we give rhythmic stimulation at this frequency here, so this is at 12 hertz, we see an increase in the power of that 12 hertz signal for rhythmic stimulation, which is targeting those motor areas of the brain here. And when we give arrhythmic stimulation, it's not there. So we can see quite clearly that we're increasing the power of those brain oscillations with this targeted rhythmic stimulation. Okay, let's now move to what happens in people with Tourette syndrome. So can we see any benefits of this 
in people with Tourette's syndrome. So as you may have heard in a previous talk, um, we took 19 people. Ooh. Where's it gone? What did I do? Ah. Okay. 19 people with Tourette's syndrome. Um, three found the procedure slightly uncomfortable, so withdraw. They tended to be quite young, so they were tended to be sort of um, under 12 years of age. Um, they found it slightly uncomfortable. I think largely that was um, that they were anxious before they even got there about what they were going to get. Um, most people, as you see, there's a poster outside that talks about this. Uh, most people find it quite comfortable and uh, easily tolerated. So, of the remaining 16, uh, nine males aged 14 to 51, the mean age was 22, and the data that we collected was videotapes of their tics, which were analysed blind. So the people doing the analysis had no idea what type of stimulation they were getting, or if they were getting any stimulation at all. Um, we gave people randomised periods of stimulation versus no stimulation. And during the stimulation, we asked people to rate how strong their urge to tick was. And we got them to do this by using this slider device. So imagine in front of you is a device which you could slide in one direction if you have strong urges to tick. And if your urges feel less strong, you can slide it in the other direction. So from that, we can get a sort of continuous picture of how strong your urges are over time. What did this look like? Well, let me show you a video of one of the individuals. Yeah. So this is Charlie. Charlie oh, oh, scores oh, oh, 100 oh. out of 100 yeah. on the Yale. Say funk. Say it. Say he it has funk. both vocal and motor oh. tics, as you can you see. You like camel shit. And his tics <laughs> cause him Is it time to a pass? lot of difficulties yes. in his everyday ah. life, as you might imagine. It's affected his schooling his ability to sustain a job, and um, it's, yeah, it, it's very debilitating for him. Woo! So at the moment, as it says up here, he's not oh. receiving any stimulation. Yeah. Shortly, the stimulation is going to get turned on, and you'll see the effect. Yeah. I think he was about 20. Now he's moving the slider to indicate, with his left hand, to indicate that uh, his urge to tick has dramatically reduced. You notice he's still got some blinking ticks. But most, if not all, of his really fluid motor tics and vocal tics have now gone. And I'm showing you this video because it's representative of many of the videos that we've got. So it's, this isn't just a an unusual case, um, we see um, improvements in pretty much um, all of the people we tested. And there's a poster out there by a, a, a US group in St. Louis who've replicated this effect independently in another lab. So shortly, this stimulation is going to be turned off. Yes. Yeah. So he's getting rhythmic 10 hertz stimulation to his right wrist all the time this is going on. No, we have used 12 hertz. So it's always within that range, that what we call the mu band. And there's, that's because it's targeting the somatosensory areas of cortex 
uh, whereas the beta band, which is also circulatory movement, is targeting the motor areas. Yeah. Now the stimulation's turned oh. off. So as I say, we have a number of Don't similar videos me. I could show you of different people. I'm a precious paedophile. Since we published this work, we've replicated Ooh. it. We recently actually... Um, precious maiden pedo. Quite interesting. Put your hand up if you're a whore. Radio 4, uh, whore. the BBC, ran a, the, were doing a documentary whore. on Tourette's syndrome and they asked to come and talk to us about our work. And the presenter who was presenting the whole 30-minute uh, programme I'll stop this now for a second. Okay. Woo! So I'll carry on talking over it then. So the, um, the presenter who was, who was presenting the, um, and doing the um, uh, programme himself had Tourette's syndrome and he was telling us beforehand um, about the, all the therapies he tried that had been ineffective and uh, he was telling us about his experience of Tourette's syndrome. And he asked on live while he was being interviewed um, to try the device. And he put it on and um, almost straight away burst into tears in that he said it's the first time in his experience that the urge to tick, which he sort of had continuously, was gone. Um, and he was quite shocked by the, the effect. So, you know, we have replicated this many times since the original publication. This summarizes the data from that study so here we have three aspects that we looked at the frequency of ticks the intensity of ticks and the intensity of that self-reported urge on the left of each of these columns we have the no stimulation blocks versus the median nerve stimulation blocks and what we find is statistically significant reductions in tick frequency uh, in tick intensity and Pretty much all of the, pay, all of the individuals um, reported that their urge was reduced with the stimulation, um, but in this occasion, it was just slightly below statistical significance. But since then, we've gone on to sort of replicate that um, uh, with other, other individuals. So where are we now? So we've pre-registered um, a UK-wide double-blind sham control clinical trial which started in March so that trial is ongoing um, to do that we had to build these wearable devices so this is a sort of prototype device it's not the device that we think ultimately will um, be available to people it has different properties for example it's quite large sits on the wrist here and it's, this one is programmed, so it can only be used once a day, and it can only be used for 20 minutes a day. And we program the amplitude uh, so that the individual can't change it. It's a clinical trial, so everyone sort of has to have the same stimulation at the same time. Um, we did test that it works in the same way as the other device you saw. So this is this MEG data uh, comparing active stimulation with this device against sham stimulation. And you can see that we've replicated the brain effects that we've seen before. So the device does work in the same way as uh, the device that you saw. And of course, this is now available to the people in the trial for home use. So they've gone home, they've been trained how to use it. They've been, and every day they will have 20 minutes of stimulation while they're being videoed. The videos are captured and then they're blind analyzed for changes in their tick severity, the tick intensity. Um, obviously we can't do the urge to tick. In parallel with that, we're also taking a whole range of other sorts of measurements. So we're collecting Yale scores to measure um, the aspects of the Yale score. We're, we're collecting data on their ADHD symptoms, on their OCD symptoms, on their levels of anxiety, depression, all of the other sort of co-occurring conditions that uh, people are interested in. And um, that will look to see if there's a cumulative effect of daily stimulation. The point I want to make about that is that that would be nice 
if it turns out that daily stimulation for sort of a month or two months was a benefit and, re and then led to an extended period of a reduction in ticks. But that's sort of not what people with Tourette's asked us for. What people with Tourette's asked us for was a means to control the tick. So if the only thing we do is to produce a device that when you press a button can give you an hour's relief from your ticks, then that may be sufficient for what people actually want. Many people might value the opportunity, for example, when they're in school or when they're um, in a work situation, say a job interview, of being able to just tone down their ticks for a period of time. They might be quite happy to tick at home or in their friends or in other situations, but there might be situations where they want control of their ticks. And that's what patients said they wanted and, and that's what we've tried to uh, aim to try and deliver. In terms of where we're going, so in parallel with a, a clinical device that you could wear to modulate your ticks, um, we've developed uh, a phone app which has a number of aspects to it and, uh, as follows. Firstly, the phone app can be used. Uh, these are not what the device is going to look like. They're just representations taken from the internet of what wearable devices look like and what a phone looks like. Um, the idea is that the parameters that control the device will be controlled by the app. So when you get your device, you'll control it by using the app. Okay. What we also hope uh, and plan is that when you use the device, the device will communicate wirelessly back to the app to tell you about aspects. For example, what times of day you're using the device, how long you're using it, what the parameters were. Okay? It's possible that we can build in sensors into the device, the commercial device, to measure aspects of your, your um, physiology. Perhaps, for example, we could build in accelerometers to look at movement and ask um, and collect data, for example, on your movements and how the stimulation is affecting your movements. There's lots of things that potentially we can do. But the idea then is that the app communicates with the device and then the device communicates back with the app. The second thing the app does, and I want to take a few moments to tell you a little bit about this, is to address something that um, many individuals with Tourette's have told me is a problem and, and what parents of children with Tourette's tell me is a problem, which is that they may get to speak to a healthcare professional about their Tourette's fairly intermittently and rarely. It may be sort of six months, 12 months between visits. And then when they get to see the healthcare professional, that healthcare professional has a busy schedule and they have a few minutes to actually tell the professional about their experience of their tics. And many people find that quite stressful. You know, they've got to get it all out in 15 minutes. They've got to say, and what the healthcare professional might say is, how have you been, you know, in the last 12 months? You know, how have your tics been? Um, how was the medication? You know, is it still working? Blah, blah, blah. And of course, it's difficult to summarise what the last 12 months have been like for you. Um, you've got to remember it. Uh, you've got to get it out, express it. Maybe you're a bit anxious being in the clinic. You've know, waited a long time. You want to get it all out. So the thing that we've tried to develop here is a, a tick tracker, a diary that allows you over time to track your symptoms. Now, it's not magic, this device. So you have to give it data. Uh, and you can set how much data you give it, but the idea is it will poll you randomly at different times of the day. You can set out how often. You can set out um, if there are particular times you don't want to be polled. But the idea is the tick tracker will poll you at different times of the day and ask you a series of short questions. So rate out of a scale of 1 to 10 how your ticks are. Rate out of a scale of 1 to 10 of how your um, premonitory urges are. What is your current situation? Are you at home? Are you at work? Are you at school, etc.? Um, how did you sleep last night? Um, have you taken any exercise today? Uh, 
simple questions like that that could be done quite quickly. You have the option to set up how often you're polled, what sorts of questions you want to be asked. Some of them are mandatory, like how are your ticks today. Others are optional. You can opt in and out. It allows you to upload a photograph of what your ticks look like, so you can take a video of your ticks, uh, which is then available to show your healthcare professional. What it then does is over a period of time, it builds up a picture of what your ticks look like. So it tells you perhaps what on average, what your ticks are doing each day. It perhaps tells you which situations you tend to tick more or less. It might tell you if there are particular aspects of your life which tend to increase ticks, for example, poor sleep, stressful situations, uh, whether there are certain things that improve your ticks, perhaps exercise or, or some other aspect. Um, it can be used to track perhaps the efficacy of treatment. So say you see your healthcare professional and they say, well, I'm going to change your dose. Okay? Perhaps you can then look, well, what do my ticks look like you know, three months before the dose change versus the three months afterwards? Has the change of medication worked? Yeah, these sorts of things. And what it then does is put all that into a format that the healthcare professional would like. So it's a PDF report that we've got healthcare professionals to advise us how they'd like the data presented. So, you know, nice coloured graphs showing, you know, proportion of ticks in different parts of the day or this sort of stuff. So the idea then is that combined with this device, the tick tracker is providing you with a, a comprehensive, robust statement about what your ticks look like, say, over the last 12 months. Because we're collecting data from many, many people, you can also say, well, how do my ticks look like? But also, what, what do my ticks look like relative to other people? And we can use data from other people to say, well, in general, what things tend to improve ticks? Say, exercise, sleep, etc. What things tend to exacerbate ticks? Maybe anxiety or, or other co-occurring conditions, etc. So together, the idea is, long term, that the tick tracker will collect data from the device and incorporate that into your own data to give you a much more comprehensive, robust idea about how your symptoms are changing and the efficacy, for example, of the median nerve stimulation. So I think I'll stop there. That gives you an overview of what we're doing, where we're going, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Jackson, for your presentation. We will now open for questions, and I will be asking questions that came in online from the virtual attendees, along with questions from people in the room. There is a microphone at the front of the room. Um, so if I can start with one that came in online, and then we'll, we'll do one online and then one in the room as we go along. Uh, so one of the first questions was, can TMS be applied to someone who has an implanted DBS system? Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, it, it's, it's actually an extremely strong magnetic field that's being generated. Um, so, no, in the same way that we have to be careful about people with implanted DBS systems going into an MRI scanner, we'd be similarly cautious about giving TMS, which exerts a strong magnetic field. So I don't think so, no. Okay, thank you. I apologize in advance if I tear up a little bit. I haven't stopped tearing up with happiness and hope since I heard you speak yesterday. Um, uh, we have a seven-year-old son who uh, has pretty profound Tourette, and even his medical professionals haven't seen that level of severity. Um, and so very, very excited about what you've presented. My overall question is, what can we do to help? What can we do as an advocating community to get this to the US as soon as possible? I know you spoke yesterday a little bit about some of the challenges you've come up against. Yeah, well, that's a really nice question. Thank you very much. So I'm a research scientist. I'm an academic. You know, I, I teach at a university and I do research. Um, so I'm not, or up to this point, haven't really been involved in the commercial world. And what we've, the university was so um, excited by um, our results that they formed a spin-out company to help commercialize this 
uh, to produce a device. Which is fine, we had a number of fairly wealthy benefactors who were excited by the research and committed funds um, to, to, to get the work started, and that's funded the clinical trial. But the next stage is um, proving a little bit more difficult. And it's to do with the way that sort of the commercial world works. Sorry if it goes on a bit length, but just to Please do, go on. <laughs> so there's a couple of things that we have to do next. To move from the next stage of this being a sort of experimental clinical trial type device to a commercially available device, the next stage is to design the device with the help of a, you know, a, 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 an engineering company that's used to building medical devices. So we have to design a device and then build it to that specification. The next step after that is to get regulatory approval. So in the same way that drugs in, in the US have to get regulatory approval, medical devices do too. So we can't just build this and, and give it to people. What we want to do, ideally, is to build this, get regulatory approval, and then allow you to buy it, say, through Amazon or at a, a pharmacy or whatever. Um, so that's the idea, that it's business to customer is the, the, the idea um, that you'd be able to buy it in the same way that you could buy you know, some other medical device. Um, to do that, we have to get regulatory approval, and there's quite a lot of work involved in that. So we have to raise some more funding to pay for the building of the commercial device and then the seeking and obtaining the regulatory approval. And what we've done is to approach venture capitalists in the UK about this, and um, this has been a bit frustrating, uh, and it's worth telling the community here because the things that they say are just wrong. So they, they, they say that, well, Tourette's doesn't really affect adults, um, that people with Tourette's get better over the course of adolescence, so there's not many adults um, who have Tourette's. Then they say that actually there's not a lot of people who have Tourette's, so they, they're talking about prevalence levels that I would, I would um, suggest are, are, are probably poor um, estimates of the real prevalence of, of Tourette's. There's a lot of Tourette's out there in my view, there's a lot of ticks out there in my view, and that the idea of you know, only 0.5% of, of people have t Tourette's is probably wrong, in my view. Um, they also say that um, most people with Tourette's don't have very serious ticks and therefore they wouldn't want to buy this device. So they sort of think that only people who have extremely severe Tourette's would be interested in buying this device and that people who have mild to moderate ticks wouldn't want this device. And now I've approached the TAA to talk to them about, well, could they say anything about what the real experience of people with Tourette's is to disabuse these venture capitalists of the idea then that actually there's a lot of Tourette's out there, it causes a lot of disability, that people would like this device if it's offered at a reasonable cost that they could, you know, they could acquire. So I think there's perhaps a lot to be done to, to educate these people that this may be something that lots of people would, would like. And, and to, to support that, since we published our work, you know, we've had inquiries from literally all over the world um, from people saying, could they take part in the clinical trial or can they buy the device now? So. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, I'm going to ask two, uh, they're the same kind of theme, two questions that came in online. And basically it's, uh, what is your contact information and where can we get uh, <laughs> MNS? <laughs> where can we get MNS in the US? So where c can we buy the device now to try out? If yes, where can we find them? Well, unfortunately, no, you can't buy the device yet because it needs, as I've just said, it needs regulatory approval. So we can't sell the device until we've got regulatory approval. Um, but we're working as quickly as we can to do that. Thank you, Thank you so much. We'll have a question from the room, please. Yes, thank you. Um, my first thought is maybe a, a, an approach might be to add on to other wear wearables as like a piece of functionality. So like the Aura Ring um, tracks sleep patterns, also has the app already, also has much of the technology you're suggesting. So one approach might be to seek out functionality added to other wearables. That's my first thought was like, yeah. how can we do this without re recreating the wheel on it? Um, but I'm getting into solutions and I, I kind of wanted to just ask a question about um, cranial electri electrical therapy. Um, started down that approach because of depression and anxiety. Yeah. Um, it has a similar kind of 
um, pattern to when it's on, calm, cool, and found that it helps with sleep. It definitely helps with mood, but I didn't know if you had explored that as a piece of your research. Yes, so it's a really good question. Uh, it's one I get asked a lot. So a question that will probably come up, uh, which is similar, is would this be useful for co-occurring conditions? Um, and we're exploring that now. Um, a lot of our work was interrupted by COVID. Uh, unfortunately, COVID came along and stopped us doing all face-to-face -face testing, which was really unfortunate because it, came, it happened just after we published this paper and we just had to stop conducting research for about 18 months. But we've, we've started again now, and top of our list is to actually look empirically at whether or not it improves other co-occurring conditions uh, in Tourette's. The evidence we've got so far uh, seems to be that it's effective for a number of things. So we've tested people with ADHD who report that the sort of buzzing noises they report in their head is reduced while they've been stimulated. As you've just said, one of the things that pretty much everyone says is when they've been stimulated, they feel much calmer and more relaxed. People with um, Tourette's will often report that the thing that they most observe is that that sort of urge to tick, which they experience as a sort of uncomfortable sensation, is removed. So in, in Charlie's... And I guess I go that route for challenging the prevalence or severity of tics or how disruptive that is. I think the growing you know, mental health awareness, depression, anxiety, like that's enormous. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that may be a different kind of roundabout approach than to the outcome that we all would have. Yeah, I, I think, you know, what's frustrating is um, you're absolutely right. I mean, if, if you... If you add up the people who have you know, anxiety, OCD, ADHD as a co-incurring condition or separate, uh, and you see these rather separate things as part of a, a profile that many people have, then yes, it is a large number of people in the business case almost sells itself. But unfortunately, um, these people in the, in the venture capitalist world aren't really familiar with any of this. So they're sort of sceptical that there's a market out there. And also they're a bit greedy. So um, they... <laughs> They sort of, you know, any idea of helping people seems to sort of be, uh, you know, something that they're focused on. They need a, mi a billion. Uh, I think the plan was they need uh, to see a billion pound turnover a year for it to be worthwhile to invest in. Sorry, can I just interrupt? The virtual attendees can't hear you unless you speak into the microphone. Sorry. But there is one just behind you. I was just going to say that aura ring that I was talking about on sleep patterns that sells for four hundred dollars. Yeah. You know, like there's big money to be made in this. Yeah. And, and more than pharmaceuticals in yeah. treating those things. Yeah, I have to emphasize as well. I, I'm not really interested that much in making money myself. I just want to see <laughs> this thing out there. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. I'm going to take another virtual question before I come back into the room. Um, somebody is asking, I wonder what your advice would be about this. Can a simple TENS machine be set to the frequency and amplitude you used and attached to the medial nerve? And if not, why not? What is the difference? So um, the first thing is potentially yes, but actually Kevin Black's group did that and gave people TENS machines to go take home and the majority discontinued because what they said was um, even though the stimulation had been effective when they came into the lab, they couldn't be bothered with all the fuss of having a big bulky thing that carried around with wires going all up their arm that, that wasn't really portable. So what people want is something that's wearable and unobtrusive, um, which a TENS machine... I mean, TENS machine is, is made to be sort of... You sit in a chair and you have the TENS machine for pain or whatever. Also, the frequencies are quite different. So the frequency of TEMS machines typically is high frequencies, like 150 hertz, for example. Um, so it's not doing what this is doing. This is aimed at entraining those particular lower frequency oscillations that are specifically linked to the generation of movement. So if the TENS machine is effective, it's not working in the same way. So I don't think long term it's the solution. OK, we can have the next question from the room, please. Hi. Um I think you might have addressed this in your presentation, so my apologies if I missed it. Um, but the video of the of the young man with the stimulation on and then off was obviously incredible, almost too good to be true. Um, so my question is just how long do we see this effect lasting if, if they're stimulated for hours and hours? Does the Tourette's start to overpower it and do the tics start to recur? 
So um, there's a number of, so that's, thank you, that's a, an interesting question. So I'm asked this a lot. So I'm, there's a couple of questions I get asked a lot, and um, they're sort of difficult to answer. One is, do you habituate to it? That's um, you know, a, a question that comes up a lot. And of course, um, we've sort of looked at this, and as far as we can see, so we've, we've used brain imaging to actually say, if you give the stimulation, does the brain effects of the stimulation diminish over time? As far as we can see, the answer to that is no. Wow. Okay, but then someone could say, "Well, did you did you look long enough in time? You know, if you looked a bit longer, would it have gone away?" So um, the answer to that is, you know, as far as we can see, no. If there was any um, any sort of habituation, you would be able to deal with it, I think, quite straightforwardly. So one of the things we know from psychology is that you tend to get habituation to an identical stimulus. If you change the stimulus so it becomes novel again, then you get the same sort of effect. So, so you can overcome habituation by changing the stimulus. So what we would suggest is if there was a problem, we would just cycle between different frequencies to sort of refresh the stimulus so it, uh, and get rid of any habituation. What was the other part of your question, sorry? Uh, no, that was it. <laughs> okay. That's great, thank you. Okay, no problem. Great. I, I'm sure another question you must get asked a lot, and sorry if you've covered this, but it's come in a couple of times uh, on the live feed. Can you anticipate any downsides uh, to the median nerve stimulator on an ongoing basis? Are there any negative side effects that you've found so far? No. Um, so, I mean, in a sense, we can take our cue from deep brain stimulation. So if you look at the adverse effects of deep brain stimulation, they tend to be things like infection or the leads move, or you ha so you have to have more surgery to replace it. But deep brain stimulation, it's switched on, it's on for 24-7, and it has a beneficial effect. So we know from deep brain stimulation studies that uh, some continuous stimulation of the nervous system is not uh, leading to any um, particular adverse effects. Median nerve stimulation has been used in, in clinical settings for many, many, many years. Um, it's used, for example, um, in, in assessing for things like MS, where people will get media nerve stimulation to do nerve conduction studies. So we know it's entirely safe. I, well, I asked my clinical colleagues, what about if we were to give rhythmic media nerve stimulation to people, for example, who have particular types of epilepsy that can be triggered by, for example, flickering lights at a particular frequency? And they all said, no, it'd be perfectly safe. So as far as we know, um, from everything we've done, we've never seen any sort of adverse effects. The only thing that might happen with a wearable device is you might get some sort of um, rash or something appearing underneath the device in the same way that you get with a Fitbit or an Apple Watch or any other device. Um, so that's the only sort of ad adverse effect we can think of that you, know, you may get some sort of skin irritation from wearing a device like that. Great. Let's have another question from the room, please. Hi, thanks so much. Um, that was really informative. So it's actually really similar to the last um, two questions, but like anecdotally and personally for myself, like I know that when I suppress tics, you know, right after, let's say I'm suppressing it for a day, it's um, a lot worse in like frequency and severity. So I know suppressing tics is very different from the work you guys are doing, but have you guys seen any changes in like either frequency or the urges of the ticks kind of right right when it's right before it's turned on versus right afterwards? So I know you mentioned like, you know, you have a job interview, you turn it on for 15 minutes and you turn it off. So measuring that on the slider scale, is there even a difference even for a short moment where right after turning off the stimulation, the urge is increased and then it levels off? So there's some individual but that's a really nice question thank you and i can answer that in two ways um so the first thing is there's some individual variability in people's experience of this so most people come in and they've got high levels of ticks before they get stimulated turn the stimulation on in many people probably the majority they behave like charlie in the video that their ticks go down while they're being stimulated and when we turn the stimulation off, their ticks will come back. In a number of cases, the rebound of ticks after stimulation is not as great as the ticks before. There seems to be some benefit that outlasts the stimulation. I'll come back to that. For some people, paradoxically, they claim 
that they seem to experience the most relief after they've had the stimulation. So they've had the stimulation, then you turn it off, and then they say that actually they feel the most benefit immediately after the stimulation. So there seems to be a bit of individual variability in when people experience the relief. With Charlie in the video, we started just before COVID to try and explore if there were any beneficial effects of repeated stimulation. So we got Charlie to come in on separate occasions, four days apart, and then we measured his, his ticks with video, um, before stimulation, during stimulation, after stimulation, and then we looked at that across repeated sessions. And the effects were pretty dramatic. Um, what we saw was that over the course, so within each session, we saw the effect you've seen there, that ticks are high, turn the stimulation on, his ticks go down, turn the stimulation off, his ticks come up. Okay, but across time, across sessions, we saw that before stimulation, his ticks were going down across time. And then after stimulation, his ticks weren't coming up at all. And what we found at the last session, which we didn't advocate, was that Charlie felt so good about this that he stopped taking his medication. And we didn't tell him to do that. He just decided to take himself off his medication. We told him to go and see his doctor and get himself back on if needed. But he felt so good from the repeated sessions that he had stopped taking his medication as a result. So then COVID came along and we had to stop doing that. So we've started again to look at that and that's something the TAA have ad advocated that we do in, in part of our funded research now from them is to look at this sort of beneficial effect and we've, that's what the clinical trial is looking at. So I think to answer your question, there's a little bit of individual variability in whether you see an after effect or not. Um, and there are some positive signs that at least in, in some individuals, there seems to be a cumulative benefit of stimulation that outlasts the stimulation. Thanks, and just, sorry, one more quick no follow-up. Not look, I'm not trying to look for faults, but I'm just curious, have you ever seen like the, um, the reverse where right after the urge was more amplified or, or worse? For a little bit has that ever no so the most areas? compelling thing that people say not just that the, tick, the not just that we see from the videos that the tick frequency and tick intensity is reduced but the thing that pretty much everyone says is that the urge goes away awesome. that's the thing that strikes most people so many people say that urge is constant and as you say it's exhausting trying to suppress their ticks all the time and that urge is there all the time and well, during the stimulation people say it's just gone yeah i've never experienced anything like it the t you know the urge is gone Great, thanks so much. Thank you. I think that also covers one of the other questions that came in, or a comment saying that during the video, it looked like the, the young man was sort of slightly out of it. Um, and the question was whether people can do normal, go on with normal activities while this is going on. But um, for me, I think he looked emotional and, and a bit shocked. He was shocked, yeah. yeah. That, that's what that was. And, and that's the thing that several people have experienced because the first time they get this, they're shocked by the, the effect it's had on them because they've, they've not previously experienced a situation where that urge has gone away or so. So he was shocked. Um, in terms of, yeah, that's a really good question though about whether you can maintain um, uh, everyday activities. So that was a key thing for us to explore in our original work. So one thing we asked was, if it interferes with involuntary movements, would it interfere with volitional movements, you know, your ability to carry out everyday actions? And the answer to that is no. There's no material effect on your ability to carry out volitional actions. Secondly, uh, a question that we get asked a lot, does it impact on your cognitive performance? So if somehow it's... Um, it's um, interfering with these movements but it's also interfering with your ability to attend you know concentrate you know uh, then it's that's a worry so we we looked at that by asking people to carry out a really demanding cognitive task so this is uh, the one we used was a continuous performance task i don't know if people have ever come across this but imagine that you've got to concentrate on responding as quickly as possible to stimuli that appear on a computer screen so they may be you know, alpha numeric characters come up on screen and you have to press a button whenever you see one. But 
a small proportion of them, you have to withhold a response. So lots of times you're pressing the button as quickly as you can, but then when a stimulus comes up that you're supposed to not respond to, you have to stop yourself responding. So this is quite demanding. Uh, you have to concentrate really hard and you're going to make errors. And we looked at people doing this with no stimulation or with rhythmic stimulation or arrhythmic stimulation. And th the bottom line is that stimulation has no effect on your ability to do it. So you can carry out this cognitively demanded task at the same time as you're re receiving the peripheral nerve stimulation. And in fact, you know, the, the comment that many people have said is when they've been stimulated, they quickly adapt to it and it feels quite calming and relaxing for them. Great. Let's have a, a question from the floor. Uh, I know you're here to help us, but I feel like everyone in the room is like, we want to help you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so does brainstorming. Uh, so the stimulation you said increases, I'm not a scientist, um, uh, synaptic plasticity, which increases learning. And well, that's, yeah, that's the TMS. Oh, that's only the TMS part, not the... Yeah, so the, the, what, what we're doing okay. here is we're increasing the power of those brain rhythms that have to be turned off when you move. So we're making it harder for those spontaneous movements to escape, basically. But you're partly right in that some of the things that we see with TMS, we think can also be produced with this median nerve stimulation. So there are effects that we see with TMS that we think can be replicated. So one of the things, just, just, just to sort of uh, amplify my answer a bit, one of the things that we can do with TMS is change some of these brain chemicals that might be important. So we've heard about glutamate and GABA, and we know that TMS can be used to modulate the levels of glutamate and GABA, the concentrations in particular brain areas. We've just run a study where we've given media nerve stimulation and measured those brain concentrations of those neurometabolites, and we've shown that we can increase glutamate using this. So many of the things that we know from TMS, we think we can replicate with this media nerve stimulation, but we haven't done the studies yet to, to prove that yet. But, so we think probably we can induce plasticity effects as well. So you're, you're I mean, right. Because that would be amazing. Who wouldn't want to just be able to learn easier for anything? Yeah. Um, well, I think more generally, not just talking about our technique, but more generally, what the non-invasive brain stimulation can do is modulate learning. That's the one thing that gets replicated quite a lot across studies. Maybe the mechanisms can be argued about, but, the, but the, the benefits of stimulation. So the, one of the things I mentioned earlier was the idea of using stimulation as an adjunct for other forms of therapy. So if part of your therapy approach is to try and train people to do something, then I think training them to do something in the context of giving them non-invasive brain stimulation may make that training more effective. And it should make all trainings more effective, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, could you talk more about how, what you found from your studies about the co-occurring conditions for like ADHD and whether more studies need to be done on that to prove its effectiveness for that? Definitely. That would clearly Definitely. Increase. And I, I, think, I think it's worth actually emphasizing why I think it's, it might be useful for other conditions. So the core idea I want to get across is we're targeting those parts of the brain which are associated with sensory motor function. So the, the sensory aspects of the body and the motor aspects of the body. And they're connected to lots of other brain areas. So I don't think that it's right to think about targeting brain areas. We're targeting brain networks. And as you saw with the deep brain stimulation studies, if you looked at the efficacy, what the... Uh, clinician mentioned when talking about deep brain stimulation was that you got a sort of 40% improvement if you stimulate in the thalamus and you got roughly the same improvement if you stimulate in the globus pallidus. And what that tends to indicate to me is that stimulating any part of the circuit is modulating the circuit uh, and that's where the benefit comes from is changing the brain network. So to come back to your question about co-occurring disorders, many co-occurring conditions, I would say, have a sort of somatic or visceral component. By that I mean that there is some sort of body physiology component to that experience, be it anxiety, OCD, 
ADHD, Tourette's syndrome. Okay? So maybe there are other components. For, any, for example, in anxiety, there may be a mental component that's perhaps not present in, in other conditions. But there, there is a visceral component in pretty much all of those. And what we, I would argue is when we target the brain areas associated with that visceral component, then we're modulating those entire networks. So I'm optimistic, without yet having concrete data, um, that it will be effective for other conditions. The few people we've tested so far, we've tested people with anxiety disorder, who say that they feel calmer uh, and much more relaxed when they've been stimulated. We've tested people with OCD, who say that their sort of obsessive thoughts are reduced and they definitely feel a benefit. It's hard to measure as effectively someone with OCD what the change is, whereas ticks, we can count them. We can't really count the obsessive thoughts in the same way that we can count ticks. But the subjective reports from participants are that they feel the benefit, uh, similar with ADHD. Um, it's possible that there are other aspects that we could look at. For example, some sorts of pain might be modulated with this sort of approach. So we're looking at co-occurring conditions and the extent to which this approach might be useful. Because the bottom line of this is that we want to try and deliver a treatment that people can use outside of the clinic themselves at home that they're in control of, that they can turn the stimulation on when they feel they need it. Um, and, and that's something you can't do with TMS. And you, you can't do with, you know, deep, well, you can do it with deep brain stimulation, but you have to have surgery to do it. Uh, and you can't do it if you're a child. I mean, it's the other thing. Many of these treatments uh, wouldn't be advocated for, for sort of young children, like TMS, for example, or deep brain stimulation. That's fascinating. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, that's definitely covered some of the questions that came in online as well. I'm going to take one more um, of the virtual questions, and then we have two final questions uh, in the room. Um, I think the offer of help is definitely something that people are interested in and that somebody is asking, is it more difficult to get the government uh, approval by the UK or the USA? And can we start the process in both countries and see which one will approve first? <laughs> so, so to, well, to answer your question, I mean, to, get, to be able to deliver this device to people in the UK and Europe, we need to get approval from the European regulatory agencies. To deliver it in the US, we need to get FDA approval. So we'll have to go through regulatory approval processes in, in, in several countries in order to be able to... Uh, the offer of help is, is really uh, very generous of you. I mean, if we're able to put together, for example, some sort of patient experience, advocacy, um, response to the venture capitalists that, that, you know, this isn't an important condition or not many people have it or there are no adults with Tourette's or tick disorder, then, you know, that would be really helpful. Um, so, you know, and again, making people aware that, that, that this is, you know, making the venture capitalists people aware that people do want this and see it as something useful and important, I think will be enough to actually change their minds. Thank you. We're going to have a question from the room. Hi. So Hi. maybe one of the way we can collect those feedback is through that app, right? Yeah. So um, I, re I remember you said that, well, obviously we know the device is not something we can purchase right now, but can people go and download that app right now? I will check when we get back. I think we want to actually pilot the app. So, um, I think uh, I know a pilot. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so one thing I can do, um, I think my email and my details and I'll leave some cards of my email is available so you can email me but what I'll try and do is um, I'll talk to the company because obviously I'm a member of the university I'll talk to the company and see if they are keen to have volunteers pilot the app for them yeah I guess I think if we can collect like just see if once you announce it here how many people would download that app would give you a data point yeah. to talk to them, and then we can obviously answer survey question on there. And I think so, some of our participants at our lab really like to track the tech that way. And I think clinicians would appreciate seeing that data when they come in for therapy. Yeah, well, definitely, you know, we, we hold some focus groups on this back in the UK about what people wanted. And the focus groups were unanimously that people wanted some help along those lines. And then we talked to a lot of clinicians about if they were to be given a report, what would they like in it? 
And um, one comment they said was it should be brief. Um, <laughs> uh, but they also outlined the key information that would be useful for them um, in helping them manage the condition. So we've tried to follow their advice, but that would be great if we could get some help in, in piloting that. Fantastic. So we're coming to the end of the session. We have time for one more question. Uh, I get, it's a two-part question, but I'll make it one time fast. Um, okay. You threw out the word Amazon. So we're talking won't need a prescription. Are we talking ideally Amazon prices? Or are yeah. we talking medical device prices? Well, I'm, I, I think we're talking about keeping the price as low as possible. Mm -hmm. So in the UK, uh, I think one of the things we're aiming to do would be to um, demonstrate the efficacy of the device in the community, so the efficacy of the commercial device, not just the clinical trial, but that we can sell directly to people. Once that's done, I think then the argument would be to go back to the National Health Service and say, this is an effective treatment, you should now pay for it so people can get it free. Uh, and that would be the route that we would take in the UK, that it would be adopted as an accepted treatment and available free at the point of delivery for patients. Um, that's not what happens in the US, I understand. So, um, <laughs> so um, but there, I think the idea would be to make it um, on a par with other, um, other sort of medical devices that you might be able to buy over the counter. So, um, you know, a few hundred dollars, I think, would be the aim rather than thousands or whatever. And then my other, just sort of, you know, from the helper side, you know, if you want to get a book deal, you need what, you know, 30,000 subscribers to your newsletter and then they'll front you a little bit and let you give it a shot. So maybe there's an opportunity for you to create a newsletter for us. We all subscribe to you yep. and show that there's 50,000 people, 100,000 people behind you. So you can do that now. So the company has a website that people can subscribe to. So essentially you just log on you subscribe to that website and then it will give you updates about the development of the um, of the device, the progression, the progression of the clinical trial, any news or the rest of it. So I think if sort of everyone just logged on and clicked on that to be asked to update it and they had like thousands of people from across the US mm -hmm. subscribing, then I think that would be very powerful evidence that people were interested. Uh, it's, um, so the company, it's Neurotherapeutics Limited, is that right? Yes. And so it's uh, www.nottinghamtechventures.com. No, no, I no, think... Not that one. No, um, let me see if I've got it here. Okay, the name of the company is Neurotherapeutics Limited. Neurotherapeutics Limited, yeah. So I think can... it's on this card. So it's called... Here we are. So if you go to this address, www dot new pulse and i'll spell that n-e-u-p-u-l-s-e new pulse dot co dot uk so www dot new pulse n e u pulse dot co dot uk and then there's a link for you to click to get any further information um, in fact what i'll do is i'll leave this card with um, Seanich, I'll leave a bunch of them, but I haven't got that many. Um, I'll leave some cards up here. I'll give this one to Seanich, and anyone who wants it can get can make sure they've got the right address. Um, there's actually a, a one of these. What do you call these things? QR code. QR code. Yeah, <laughs> it's one of those. Well, we, and since I'm the last one standing so, at the microphone, I just think probably on behalf of the room, I just want to say thank you. Like this is. Gosh, so exciting for us. <laughs> okay. Well, and also I'd like to thank you all then for your offers of help. It's really humbling that so many people are keen to sort of try and advance this work. So thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. And thank you for all of the questions, both in the room and, and online. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I want to thank very warmly uh, Dr. Stephen Jackson. And please remember to complete this post-session survey on your app and enjoy the rest of your conference experience. But let's have another round of applause for really exciting research.